All right, good afternoon, everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So my name is Megan. I am the training specialist here at Domestic Violence and Child Advocacy Center. Those of you that have joined us for previous webinars, welcome back. Those of you that have not joined us previously, welcome. So I just wanna let you all know, we are going to be recording this session. Um, it should be available up on our YouTube in the next, next week sometime, um, along with the other trainings that are in our, in this series. They are also up on our YouTube. I will also be sending out information afterwards, just kind of a follow-up email with um, some additional resources. My coworker, Molly, is um, going to be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, there's that chat box. Make sure that you click all attendees. If you um, or all panels and attendees, if it's something that you want everyone to know or a resource or something, there is also the Q&A box that you all can utilize if you have any specific questions. So without further ado, let's get started. So we were, um, are the Domestic Violence and Child Advocacy Center. We work with folks who've ex um, experienced domestic violence or child abuse at any point in their lifetime, really working with folks because we want them to know that everyone deserves um, to feel safe at home, right? Or to feel safe in their relationships. And so kind of building off of what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with self-care, right? Self-care is really, really important. But when we're talking about advocacy, it's also really important that we recognize that self-care as a boundary issue, right? Not only when we're monitoring um, and setting boundaries or taking care of ourselves, we're modeling for those that we work with how to do those same things, right? How to take care and how to set boundaries for healthy relationships. With all of that being said, it's really important that we recognize that talking about domestic violence can sometimes trigger feelings or memories um, that we may not be prepared for, even if we've been doing this. So if at any point you need to take a breath, um, you need to say something in the chat, please feel free to do so, right? This is you all space to do those things. And so we're going to start by talking about what is an advocate, right? What is our jobs as someone or some ones who are working with folks who might be experiencing domestic violence or unhealthy relationships. It's really important that we recognize that advocacy is about empowerment. It's about allowing folks to make their own decisions. Um, and it's not telling someone not what to do. It's not saying, oh, well, you need to file a protection order. Oh, well, you need to file a police report. No, it's saying, hey, have you thought about filing for that protection order. Hey, have you thought about filing a police report? And so on. So we, oh, I hate when I do this, so sorry. Um, so it's really important that we're all advocates working toward a shared vision and mission, right? Whether we work in the court system, whether we are you know, a specific victim advocate or community-based advocate or we're a case manager, really looking at it from the standpoint that we all want to work together. Our job is, regardless of what our role is, is we're working on behalf or for others. And in this case, it's working on behalf or working for those who are experiencing domestic violence. Um, empowerment and advocacy means advocacy and education through education without coercion, and it's allowing a survivor to make their own choices and choose their own course of action. So again, rather than saying this is what you do, what I always tell folks is it's our job to provide options, right? Well, if you took this option, this is what could happen. If you decided to go with this, this is what might happen. Um, I spent a few years in domestic relations court and it wasn't my job to decide whether or not someone would file that protection order, but it was my job to walk them through. If you file today, this is what that process is gonna look like and this is also what might what the outcomes might be if you take this choice. If you decide not to file today, this is what could happen, right? So really giving that victim or that survivor the authority to make their own decisions, right? To feel confident in those decisions. Why is this important, right? Why is it important to look at, at advocacy through the lens of empowerment? One, it's gonna put responsibility for the abuse on the perpetrator rather than the victim, right? We talked last week about saying things such as, well, what did, um, what did you do? And instead saying, tell me how you responded, 
right? What did you do puts the blame on that victim versus tell me how you responded to this abusive person's behaviors, right? We're putting that, um, that accountability back on that abuser. It reduces isolation in experiencing domestic violence. And it really, really importantly reestablishes the survivor's own personal power and control while building on strengths, right? So it's helping them identify things that they've already done well, things that they want to do. And it gives them, or it can give them that confidence in saying like, no, you have the ability to make the decisions, right? I'm going to support you regardless of that decision you make. How, how can we do that? How can I help you decide what that's going to look like? I think it's also really important to recognize that a lot of us come into this work because we want to help, right? We want to, I don't know, we, we're caregivers, right? However, what gets really, really difficult, and I'll speak for myself. So the first year I started this work, um, working in our shelter as a youth advocate, and it was really, really hard for me for the first few months to not take those stories home, to not hear and work with youth and go home and cry. But what ended up happening is I would do more and more and more for certain clients or for certain families. And what happens when we do that is we burn out, right? And so we really have to be mindful coming back to setting those boundaries. It's not that we don't like our folks, it's not that we don't wanna help, but setting boundaries is so important in modeling healthy relationships. And so we wanna be in that helper category, or does that really rescuer category, right? We want to offer support when it's needed and when it's asked for. We don't want to provide assistance without asking. So if someone comes to us and says, I just need to talk, great, we're providing that listening ear and we're not then saying, oh, by the way, now that you're listening to me, you should also file an order in juvenile court and you should file a police report and you should and you should. No. Letting that victim, letting that survivor guide how our conversation goes. We're only giving what is needed rather than giving more than is what is needed or what we think that victim needs, right? There, with that comes a certain level of, det of detachment, right? That sounds kind of cold, but we have to. If we took every single person's story home with us, we would not be able to function in our lives and then give to our families, our friends, right? So we have to be able to give without expectation because when we have that client that doesn't connect with us or doesn't like us, it's not us, right? We're not taking it personally. We have to recognize that this person we're working with might be experiencing some, some, experiencing some severe trauma. And so us taking that on, it's not about us, right? The moment we start centering and start taking things personally, it becomes about us rather than coming about that victim or that survivor. It's also really important, again, boundaries. You're going to hear me say that a bunch more times because boundaries allows that survivor, that person, that family to take responsibility for their choices rather than, again, us taking that on. So what are our goals? What do we want to do? What do we want to accomplish? It's kind of three key things. We want to assess the victim's needs. We want to offer and explain options and resources. And we want to help that victim implement their choices, right? So a question we ask all the time is, tell me why you're here, right? Or tell me what would you like to see happen? That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to make it happen, but we're allowing them that voice to say, how would you like to direct this? Another important question is, what's your biggest concern right now, right? Think about you all's to-do list and you start writing and I have to do this and I have to do this and I have, and soon we're overwhelmed. And so, yeah, we can write that big long to-do list, but maybe it's what's going to happen today. All right, check. What's going to happen next week? Don't think about two months from now. Don't think about a year from now. That's overwhelming. What are we going to do today or within the next week or within the next couple of weeks before I see you again? Offer and explaining the options and resources. I think a lot of times we think or what I hear is, oh, you're, you know, advocates, domestic violence. We're doing all this really great work and it's rainbows and sunshine. No, right? A lot of our job as advocates is to have really, really tough conversations, really hard conversations, but we're doing it in a way that's empathetic. We're doing it in a way that's understanding and supportive. So maybe it means, hey, if you file this protection order, I, I'm not going to tell you if it's going to be denied or not or granted, but I need you to know that this is a standard it reaches. And from what I'm hearing, there may not be enough for this protection order to be granted. And that victim is going to get mad and you don't understand or, hey, I really you know, you don't qualify for this housing option. And they're gonna hold on to that, you don't qualify. But 
how can we say, hey, this isn't working, but what I found is maybe we can explore this other thing, right? In that implementation phase, it's gonna look like you can do this, right? So one thing, when we safety plan, tell me ways that you've already kept yourself safe. Hey, you've been doing this for a year, six months, two years. You know how to keep yourself safe, right? You're doing this, you're already here. You're asking for help. That's a really, that's hard to do. And so you're already taking steps, right? Preparing, okay, here we go. Organizing and then strategizing. Okay, what's this gonna look like? Let's, and sometimes that also might look and it sounds silly, like role playing, right? Okay, here's a mock trial, here's a mock, you know, court hearing, what are some questions that might happen or what are some things that might come up? So our role as advocates is again, to help that victim identify their own needs, provide, providing assistance for that victim to identify their own strengths, helping them to learn how the systems work. I think a lot of times we get frustrated with clients sometimes because we know this, right? We do this every single day. And when someone's just not understanding, we're like, why, you know, why can't they get it? What's going on? But we have to remember that one, a lot of times they're in trauma. And so trauma brain, someone's not going to hold on to something. Two, it's confusing. Think how many community partners you all work with or other organizations. And we all might have different processes. And so we're asking someone to understand all of these different systems and jump through all of these hoops, right? So it's on us, it's not on them, it's on us for them to understand, right? And to help the victim see what they've learned about themselves. Hey, you've been coming to support group for six months. And I just, you know, I noticed today that you said this thing or you've been, you know, you feel, you seem more confident, you're talking more. I don't know if you recognize that. And I just want you to know that that this is pretty great. I'm really proud of where you've come from, or I'm really excited to see the growth that you've made. Um, think about when someone, you know, we know or care about says something like, hey, notice that you're doing this thing really well. It feels good. And so making sure that we're acknowledging those steps that a victim has taken. What skills do we need to have, right? Good communication skills. So active listening. This isn't, you know, sometimes we might have seven, eight, 15 clients to see in a day. So when we have that half an hour, that hour with a client, we're putting our phone on mute, we're putting our cell phone away, we're closing our door and we're letting our coworkers know, I'm here to listen for you. Now, when we can't do that, we can say, hey, I really wanna hear what you have to say. If this certain person calls, I'm gonna have to take it. I wanted you to know that ahead of time so you know that I'm not ignoring you, right? Or hey, it's, you know, I, we have till 1230. At 1230, we're going to have to end this. That doesn't mean we end the conversation forever, but it means we end it for right now. Knowledge and comfort with cultures and lifestyles other than our own, right? Recognizing, so I'll give you a fun fact about me. I grew up in Idaho. So when I moved to Cleveland and started working in a shelter in Cleveland, Ohio, um, I'm not going to relate to some of our shelter clients in the way like I'm, I'm a country girl I grew up next to farm you know I get asked the question where's your family potato farmers yes they yes they were and so I have to recognize that I need to be open and aware of one my privileges but also open and listening to other folks that come from different places and being comfortable sitting in my discomfort right it's also important that we have critical thinking assessment and planning skills we know domestic violence. I know domestic violence. However, I don't know every single person I'm working with. And so while I might have that foundation, it's really important for me to be able to plan and prioritize when different folks come in with different needs. Knowledge of my own limitations, right? I'm not going to be the best advocate or I might not know. And so rather than making it up, I'm going to say, I don't know. Let me get back to you right? And then again, with the boundaries and the self-care, it's modeling healthy interactions with our clients, with our coworkers, with whoever it is, like, right? Our clients are absorbing everything that we're doing. And so if we can set those healthy boundaries and those things, they're going to be able to, whether we realize or not, kind of take that in. And so what an advocate is not. These are important reminders for us because, again, I think we get frustrated sometimes when we're not, you know, our clients are going back home or not doing what we want them to do. It is not our job to fix the problem, right? It is not our job to take away a survivor's pain. It's our job to say, you're allowed to feel angry. You're allowed to feel annoyed, right? Now, you're not allowed to yell at me and call me a bee. You can yell around me, 
but again, setting that boundary. But it's, you, sometimes we have to sit in our discomfort and have to sit in our pain and we have to allow our, our survivors and our clients to do that as well. It is not our job to know everything. It is not our job to give advice, right? Hey, well, Megan, if you were in my situation, what would you do? Hey, Megan, have you ever been a victim of domestic violence? I'm, I'm hearing that you're asking those questions, but what I want to tell you is it's not about me. I am not in your situation, so I can't answer this question. What I can do is I can walk you through what if, but I am, again, I'm not in your situation. Also, I think it's really important for us to know that it's not our job to like everyone we work with, right? That would be, it's a kind of a silly request, right? We're, we're going to have clients that we don't like, and that's okay. Our clients should not know when we don't like them, but it's okay to not like every client, right? It's also really important. Do not make promises you cannot keep because what happens is the moment we make a promise and we can't do it, that's what our clients hold on to. Well, you told me you would. Yes, I know. And we've lost their trust and potential other advocates or other agencies have lost that trust. Letting our biases dictate your actions. We all have implicit bias, right? We all have different lived experiences and so important it's important that we recognize when we're feeling a certain type of way about a client or someone that we stop and we recognize that be mindful of our language right if a client calls themselves a victim i'm using victim right um modeling and mirroring what they're saying so saying if a client says something like i can't sleep at night i'm so afraid Say, it's not unusual for you to be afraid, right? Letting them know that their feelings in that language is okay. It's also really, really important for us to offer that validation and hope without offering that toxic positivity. And this is one of those things I'll say, and, but rather than, than saying like, you'll get over it, just be positive, right? Good vibes only, like every emotion's welcome here. This is hard, right? You're, you're getting through it and I have full faith that you can continue to get through it. You might not, you know, some days are going to be worse than others, but you're, you're strong for simply being here, right? And so looking at this, we're going to take just a few minutes and talk about the importance of cultural humility in our work, right? So I recognize, I'm going to skip over a couple of these things, um, but it's really, really important to recognize gender-based violence comes from a frame of a patriarchal society, right? And so when we're looking at those roots, um, more often than not, women have been the victims and women-identified folks have been the victims of domestic violence. And historically coming from that domestic violence perspective, it's been a lot of white women doing this work as kind of the forefront. And so we have to really incorporate, I was on a really good webinar the other day, maybe a couple weeks ago, or maybe Molly probably knows what I'm talking about, but they were talking about how, you know, women of color and black women in particular have been talking for a long time in this work about the justice system not necessarily being the end all be all. And unfortunately, what we did as white women is we kind of ignored what they've been saying. And now we're catching up to like, oh man, other folks were right. And so we have to recognize our places of privilege, right? So me as someone coming in as an advocate, I am a white, cisgendered, able-bodied, educated, middle-class person coming in and working with folks who might not look or have the same lived experiences as, as me. And so let's look at some of these, right? Rillette, recognizing that folks might not have the same religion or faith as me. That's okay. We, they don't have to believe the same thing. I don't have to believe the same thing, but it's really important that we validate their beliefs, right? Race, ethnicity, again, we do not all have the same lived experience. We might not have the same cultural or upbringing. And so I think about this a lot when I worked at shelter and we would talk about parenting. And so I have to recognize that Cult, different cultural backgrounds have different things. And so I have to stop myself from saying, oh, well, this isn't how I would do it. Well, great, you, that's not how you would do it. But if this is working for them, then, then that's okay. And listening. Working with folks with different gender identities or expressions. We don't always have to understand someone's identity. We don't have to relate, right? But if someone is saying, hey, my name's Taylor and my pronouns are they there, then we're saying, Hey, Taylor, it's nice to meet you. And we're mirroring those pronouns that they are using. We're not trying to push our personal beliefs onto them. 
um, other things that we need to look at. Socioeconomic background. So a lot of times, a lot of us are moving towards virtual experiences. We started our virtual support group. So we have to recognize that maybe folks we don't work with don't have solid internet connection, don't have computers, right? So what are we doing to meet those folks where they are as well? Family dynamics. Every family is going to look different, right? How many of us were, you know, how many years old and we realized, wait, your family does that? Oh, not every family does this? Huh, I thought everybody called this certain thing whatever, right? And so again, being open to understanding those things. And also, so again, domestic violence, looking at the historical piece, is most of the time men abusing women, but we also have to think about same-sex relationships or folks that maybe, again, that gender identity is different and it's not, we're not understanding this relationship. So if someone's experiencing domestic violence and they are also gay, they have multiple layers that they're going to have to work with. And so I would love to hear from you all just because I, you know, like what are other cultural considerations, right? This is by no means um, a definitive list. And so are there other cultural considerations you all have come across or that you all have seen in your work? known others all right no and that's fine um but i think it's again important to recognize that where we're coming from is not necessarily where everyone is coming from and so looking at this kind of i think this is such a good this came from oddn and was kind of we adapted it a little bit but it's looking at those types of abuse right that we've talked about isolation emotional abuse sexual abuse financial abuse and physical abuse and so let's look at that first one with people of color. So isolation, right? Historically, um, folks of color are dealing with gentrification, redlining, that's isolation, right? Emotional abuse, language, um, financial abuse, hiring practices, right? Or the physical abuse, the historical contact of police brutality. And so one thing that I had to learn a lot is when, you know, I'm safety planning, it was always safe for me as someone, as a white woman growing up in Idaho, that, oh, if I needed something, I would just call the police. One thing I had to learn is that calling the police isn't safe for everyone, right? Or folks don't want to call the police because they don't want their partner arrested. They just want the abuse to stop in that moment. And so calling the police might not be the best option for everyone. Looking at LGBT individuals, right? That isolation of being forced to stay closeted. And so maybe they're in this relationship um, and their coworkers don't know they're out. And so this person is threatening, if you break up with me, if you don't follow along with what I'm, what I'm going to say, then you're going to be abused, then I'm going to out you, right? You're not a real man. You're not a real woman, right? And so making sure that when we're coming from that place, of advocacy, right? They're coming from that place of empowering folks to do what they want us to do or or we wanting them to be safe. We're letting them make their own decisions, right? We're empowering them through questions like, what would you like to see happen? How would you like to handle this? And again, knowing that we don't have to have all the answers. And so I want to, this is a lot of information and a lot of heavy information in a very short period of time, but I want to make sure we've got about five minutes left that we open it up for questions, right? So coming from that empowerment model and not necessarily that we're here to, I think one thing I say to, to folks a lot is that we're not here to save anyone. I've been doing this work for over 10 years. Never once in my career have I saved anyone. That is not my job. That is not my role. My role, and as cheesy as it sounds, is to be, is it, if anyone has a better way to say this, I would love to hear it. My role is to be a tool in someone's toolbox, right? I'm here to provide options and resources for them to help. And so it's changing our mind frame of how can I save these folks to what options, and sometimes that option is just being that listening ear. So I'd love to hear questions you all have or experiences you all have in doing this work and as being, as being advocates in this work as we kind of wrap up.
No questions today, or are we all just taking the time to to breathe through this jip that somehow stopped? I don't know why it stopped. Breathing, yeah, it's important. And sometimes too, advocacy and sitting with folks can also be doing that with them, right? So if you have one thing that I found really helpful, and I'm sure if, you know, some of you all know these things, but it's just nice to remind ourselves, right? If you have a client that's talking really loud and starting to yell or starting to threaten, then we can say like, talk quieter, right? Whisper. And so then they have to stop and they have to hear us. We're saying like, hey, okay, let's sit in our discomfort. Or tell me why you're feeling that way. Yeah, Lisa says it's a struggle for the client. We can igno cannot ignore that this is also a struggle for us, but we have to stay focused. Exactly, and so it's it's hard, right? And that's why it's important. We talked when we talked about self care, and if you missed that recording, it's up on our YouTube. It's recognizing what our triggers are, and so when we're feeling triggered by a certain client, because some clients might remind us of our mom or a friend or you know an ex or whoever it is, and we're like, oh, this person is rubbing me the wrong way. It's really important that we don't let that client know that, right? Um, and allow them to do that. But then afterwards, it's also really important for us to go to our coworker and say, I just need you to listen to me, just like the client needed us to listen to them. Finding those folks that we can go and just vent to for a little bit. Because the moment we start making it about us, you know, the moment we start focusing on where we're at or what we need or how I'm feeling, that shift, it's, it's no longer about the client, right? It's no longer about, about us helping them. It becomes about us. Work with addiction. And that, oh, yeah, addiction is adding that layer of, and so, right, so coming back to, we talked about cultural humility. This is a very kind of short, concise, like domestic violence is this. Um, now add on, like we talked about LGBT folks, and now add on addictions, whether it be addictions for a victim, whether it be addictions for someone who's making the choice to abuse their partner, that adds on that additional layer. Yeah. And that empathy is so, so important. And so maybe it looks like, hey, let's breathe for a couple minutes. You, and I say, you're going to think I'm real cheesy. You might roll your eyes at me. But what I want us both to do is I want you to put both feet on the ground, right? Put your hands on your legs. If you need to like rub your legs, rub your thighs, like do that. If you need to do some tapping but I just want you to breathe for a minute, right? And that's so simple. It doesn't seem like a lot. And then say, hey, when you feel overwhelmed at home with your kids, this takes 10 seconds. This takes 30 seconds. I want, these are a technique that we're giving them. Yeah. Other questions, concerns, right? This is a space for you all to kind of Learn from one another as well. All right, well, we've got about a minute. Um, and so I wanna be mindful of folks' times because I know that we're all, now we're readjusting to maybe stay at home orders being lifted, um, things changing, still staying socially distant. But you know, for those of you in Cleveland and Cuyahoga County, we're here, we're open. And so if, you know, we referenced in the advocacy that you don't have to have all the answers. And so if you have a client that you're not quite sure what to do, call our helpline, have your clients call our helpline, call or text. Um, folks can chat on our helpline or chat on our website. Um, we're, we're open. Um, I'm sure like most of you all, our services look a little different, but they're still happening. And so I just want to say thank you for spending this afternoon with me. If you all have other questions, like I said, we're here. And so enjoy the rest of you all's afternoon.